The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I am the host for this podcast. My husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer of the podcast, and I would say he's the mastermind behind it. I just do the interviews. Anyhow, today's episode is episode number 273. We, um, yeah, we have just been podcasting every week for the last five plus years. And we've learned so much about the whole addiction pandemic that's in this country and across the world. And we hope that we've given you guys some help and that we've also given you hope because we know that it can be a pretty dark and hopeless place, addiction can. So please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a good rating so that people will find us on Google when they are looking for a podcast about addiction. Also, go to our YouTube channel, and all of these are the same name that you can see up there in the corner right there. The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Um, that's also our Facebook page, YouTube channel, and our website. Well, the website is just theaddictionpodcast.com. Anyway, go to YouTube, find our channel, subscribe to our channel, give us a thumbs up on our video, and also ring the bell so we, you can be notified whenever we have a new video. Today we are interviewing an interesting lady named Ethel Light. Ethel Light is a media figure with 50,000 followers on Instagram. She's an author, a PhD candidate, a positive psychology professor, and the founder of Sign Shine. She has researched and worked on communication, self-expression, and relationships for the past 20 years. In September 2013, she was found breathless on the floor with a heartbeat of 21. She experienced clinical death and saw the white light. She wouldn't be here today if she hadn't been revived by the paramedics. Since then, she's been helping people overcome the challenges of living with unhealthy obsessions that cause, cause self-destructive behaviors. Let's talk to Ethel Light. Ethel Light, thank you so much for being willing to be on the podcast today. I did get your name correct, right? Right, you did. <laughs> okay, good. I I had a lady on the other day and I just, I, I think I butchered her name so badly. I had to go back and do my intro because I, I really didn't have it right. It was oh, one of those ones where everybody does it. Yes, yeah, one I of those ones a... with S's and Z's. And I was like, ah, I don't know how to say this. Anyway, thank you for being willing to be on the podcast today and sharing your story. And I know you also have some great advice and great tips for families who are going through addiction. So thank mm -hmm. you for talking to us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. I was looking forward to have you, finally to, to be in your podcast. I love it. I love it. So we want to start with you. I want to hear about how you grew up, um, your childhood. You have your own history with drugs. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually, I don't have personally um, any experience with drugs, okay. but I'm an addict. I'm an oh. addict to people. I love people who are addicts. I love oh. people who are having uh, issues with addiction. And that's why I'm here to tell my story and uh, to share how it impacted my life. It's pretty interesting because most of our listeners are people who have problems with any addiction, right? Mm -hmm. I've included myself. And it's interesting because the research shows that mostly they grew up in a household with addiction. So let me tell you a little bit. Um, I was born in Jerusalem, Israel. Uh, I call myself sometimes the holy chick, Jerusalem. <laughs> and I really didn't see any alcohol or drugs at home. So apparently there was no really addiction in my home, right? But oh boy, um, when I grew up, I learned that there was addiction. My dad was an addict, but not to alcohol and not to drugs. His addiction is in a form of women. So he went to other women and my mom, her drugs, again, wasn't any alcohol or, you know, drugs. Her addiction was my dad. Mm. So here we go. I grew up, I'm uh, the oldest of six kids, and I saw the chase. Uh, from a very young age, I saw my mom chasing my dad. My dad loves her, you know, because it doesn't mean that he doesn't love her. Right. But his um, choice was something different. When I was 14 years old, my dad... I should say, finally, my mom didn't think this, you know, back then. I was 14. My youngest brother was three months old. There were six kids and my dad left. Mm. 
And this is when I learned to really be attentive to what's going on. I never really attended to my feelings, what I want. It was always, you know, my mom, who is the person who is chasing after the men. And that's what I learned. I learned to get the charming, sweet guy and to kind of like shape myself to what he is. Mm. And for me, this is sometimes the drug that is really the hardest to refrain from because how do you stop having relationships from people? Yep. Right. I mean, you know, many 12 step programs and many um, other detox, you just, you know, stop, you know, stop the substance or the alcohol, but you need to have relationships with people, right? We're not pandas. You know, Johnny, I love this uh, story when people tell me, look, but I'm not, I'm not a panda. You know what a panda? I didn't know that. A panda lives in a bamboo and they're solist. And only when they want to mate, they get out, you know, they mate, they give a birth to a baby panda. And then when the baby panda is a year old, the baby panda leaves and that's it. The panda leaves by itself. Wow. So we are not pandas. We need people. They're loners. Some, they're loners, right? Mm. And we are not. We are humans. But for some people, and I'm not, I'm not going to put like, you know, a generalization, but mostly for women, it's this addiction to the love. He's my soulmate. He's my love. This is what it is. And then starts all this really almost neglecting of the self for love. And you can mm. see me with my fingers. I'm kind of like doing, you know, love. Yep. Yeah. So but this was my childhood. Okay. So at 14, your father left. Right. And... For a woman who was eight years older than I am. So I was 14. Yes. And she was 22. Can you imagine? Ah. Right. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So how did that affect your life? And, and what then happened to you after that? Right. I was an overachiever. You know, I went to a highly gifted high school. I helped my mom. I was a mom. I was, a, I was born a mom because I had, you know, five siblings. I was born a mom. I actually love my dad. You know, I don't want to the listener to think that, okay, you know, we, the families, and I put it like, you know, quote unquote, like, don't like the addicts, the other way around. I love my dad, my dad, I have so much compassion and forgiveness for him because this is a sickness. This is a disease. He really didn't know, but I grew up to be in between my parents, you know, like my mom don't talk to my dad and my dad, you know, um, at the age of 17, I was recorded to the Israeli intelligence. <laughs> And my really achiever, I was actually a commander in the Israeli intelligence. At so 17. I'm a toughie, be careful. At 17 and a half. Yeah, at 17, wow. I was recorded 17 and a half. Right. Wow. So you see this dimple? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. I won't get on your bad side. Okay. I promise. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I was in the Israeli intelligence. This is for the first time in my life that I was actually by myself, Johnny. Like by myself, right? I was always with other kids. I always walked on eggshells so nobody would be sad or upset. I never wanted my mom to be sad. I really didn't live my life. And that was the first, I mean, this is incredible for a child, for a little girl who grew up in a place of addiction to just be by herself. And I realized that I have great leaderships. So all this folded laundry, taking care of other people, managing and when my dad left we really didn't have money so i cleaned with my mom um government office buildings you know that's what i did we, we cleaned a floor after a floor i think this is how i became an author because mm -hmm. we went in the evening you know i saw the little pictures on people's desks and i made up stories <gasps> oh this one has a girlfriend and this is the family and maybe this guy's by himself and i made up stories in my head this is the little author mm -hmm. and uh, i think the, for me, being a commander in the Israeli intelligence gave me the self-observation. Who am I really like? Because I never knew. You know, I always wanted to be loved by my grades. And I know it's the story of many. I'll show you my grades. You will love me. Yep. And I would imagine that being a commander in, 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 in Israeli intelligence, you got to stand on your own and you got to keep your own counsel and you have to, you know, like be responsible a lot mm -hmm. for yourself. Right. I right. I'm going to reveal, right, I'm going to reveal my age. It's also in my book, but you know, I was a commander in the Gulf War. 
So I don't remember, I don't know if how many people know, but the Gulf War was really not a physical war. It was a, really an intelligence war. So not only that I was responsible for myself, I was, that's something that it was easy for me to do, to be responsible for others, Yeah, you know, to like, okay, what do we do now? Let's do it. I'm very good in stress modes. And that's what I was seeking later on when I chose my ex-husband, right? Uh, it was the sweet charming, right? Yeah. So, so how, long, how long were yeah. you in Israeli intelligence? How long? I was two years, but then I did one more year in the uh, citizen, as a citizen. Uh, and then I did my uh, bachelor there in the Hebrew University. And I got an offer job to teach here because, you know, I knew Arabic and how to teach. I know actually five languages, different fonts. Um, and then I came here to teach one year. I got a job offer and I thought, you know what? Why not? But I wanted a different experience. I didn't want to be in the chaos of the family. I didn't want to hear my mom whining again about her dad, about my dad, not her dad, mm -hmm. about my dad going and not paying attention and all that, that they're divorced. And I see it with many people, you know, it's being in the victim mode. Me, 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 me. And that was my mom's story. I love her. It's not her story today. That's another Victoria story. But um, that was her story. And I had to leave. I had to leave living my mom's life. Because when I picked up the phone to my mom, it was always, so what about your dad? And what did he do? And it wasn't really about that. And I came here to teach one year, only one year. <laughs> and uh, in the end of it, um, the principal of the school asked me to stay. They love me so much. They say, stay, you know, we'll give you a green card. I'm like, oh boy, I want to go home. <laughs> and I thought, you know what, if I'm staying, let me do my master's. So I did my master's at Pepperdine University in leadership and psychology. Shocker, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome. So there was something in your, in your bio or something in the email that you sent us where you said you, um, hold on, you mm -hmm. were in 2013? Are we yes. there? September? Right, we're there. Yes. So what happened there? What or and if you need to tell more about what led to it. Um right. So in September two, 2013, actually 2012. I don't know what I wrote 13. My ex-husband found me on the floor with you know heartbeat of 21 going down. I was actually I saw the white light. Um 21 going down, going down. And I, and I saw the white light and I remember this moment when the white light, and I know it sounds like if somebody would tell me that I would never be them, but it happened to me. And the white light said, help, call for help. And it says the names of two of my kids. I, had, I have two kids, boy and a girl. Okay. And I have no idea what happened because I wasn't here. My ex-husband then come to the bathroom, checked my heartbeat and called 911. When they rushed me to the, you know, they revived me at home on the bed of my daughter. And when I got to the hospital, I remember the doctor opened my eyes and asked me, did you play with drugs? And all of my being wanted to tell him, this is not me. This is him. Because really, I never played with drugs. Huh. You know, but I lived with someone with addiction. The dad of my kids was an amazing, funny, sweet guy. He's an addict. So I don't but, understand. So what had happened to exactly. you? It's, it happens to many people who live with a person with an addiction. They take the addiction upon themselves, almost like the addiction that was themselves. And I was sick inside, Johnny. I was actually sick. I had a bacteria that took over all of my immune system and got into my heart. That's what it did, this bacteria. But really what it was really is the shame and the embarrassment that I can tell and shout the world, he's an addict. Mm. I can come to him and say, save your life because I lived again someone in his life. What From was he addicted to, to tell What was he addicted to? Uh, opiates. opiates. Oh, okay. And again, I don't want to, you know, he's the dad of my kids and I admire mm. him and I respect him. But I didn't know back then. Yep. All I knew is I was literally waking up in the at 5 a.m., you know, I was a runner. I used to wake up and run in the morning. I used to hide the keys of our of his car, the spare key, get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and look for the drugs in his car. Because I'm like a bottle of alcohol. You can't really smell it or hear it. It's a very quiet addiction, right? So I needed to prove that I'm not crazy. 
Because what happens when you come to an addict and say, hey, you're using, it's automatically the denial, right? Right. You're crazy. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. What, are, what are you you're talking dreaming. about? You're dreaming. I'm, you know, we're making it up. Yeah. We're making it up. It's you're, you're the crazy one. So I needed to prove, but I did crazy things. I am telling you, I didn't live my life. All of my life was like one channel. I'm going to find these drugs. I'm going to prove it. So we lived the life of um, relapses. So he was sober for two years, which was like the best time of our lives. And then boom, a relapse and then rehabs and so believing and again home and again. And listeners, we live in a very beautiful white collar, amazing home with trips and nannies. But I didn't know that. I thought that, you know, addicts, because I didn't know it about my home, are like, you know, bums on the streets. Yep. So Under when the I bridge, met him, homeless guy, I'm, dirty. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So when I met him uh, back in 2000, and he said, I have a secret to tell you after a few dates. And I said, yes. And he said, I'm in AA. And kidding, you know, I'm, I looked at him and said, wait, wait, AA? It's, he's not a pilot. It's not American Airlines. <laughs> it's not AAA. I'm missing an A. I'm like, what is AA? Right? I really had no clue. And when I met him, he was actually in a sober living for, you know, for a while. But I really loved him. And I thought he's amazing. I mean, we all went and did something. That's what I thought. So it's fine. But I really didn't know that I am really, I have no tools. I have no tools to be with an addict. So if you have any relationship with someone who's an addict or alcoholic, make sure you have the tools because the disease is really conniving. I'm doing my PhD right now, uh, Johnny, and it's about addiction. And it's not really about the addiction. It's about families who are affected from the addiction. Mm -hmm. And it's the same effect. Addiction, by the definition, is a family disease, which means it takes not only the addict, but also everyone that loves the addicts. So is the parents, the children, the girlfriend, the boyfriend, even the boss, everyone around them. Addiction is really like a spilling um, disease, I would say. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, so you married him and then you had two children and then mm -hmm. it got to the point where you then understood. When did you finally know like, oh, this is, this is a problem? Great question. Oh, th this is a problem. I thought that you mean like, when did I know that I want to leave him? So actually I would ask, I would answer both. So, you know, you know, me being three weeks in a hospital with a heartbeat that didn't go up 35, I knew that something is wrong. I knew that I need to change my life. I can't live like that anymore. It was a big secret. Our kids didn't know. Our friends didn't know. Nobody knew. I got distance from my family because I didn't want to tell them about it. I lived in a life of really chasing him and proving him wrong and and it didn't help. But one day I was uh, driving and here uh, I live in Los Angeles. We have the veteran um, cemetery in the middle of the city. And I remember I was driving, looking at the window and all the graves and I was thinking, I tell, this is how you want to die. Do you want to die living someone else's life? And this is the moment that I knew. This is the moment that my higher power told me, okay, I tell, I tried to show you, you're on the floor. You didn't get it. Look at it. And I, I have goosebumps when I say that. I knew that I needed a change. And it tore my heart because I have two kids and I never wanted to get a divorce. You know, I came from a divorced family. Yeah. I never did, wanted to chase someone else. And I decided to leave the marriage, which was a whole new, I call it the Kardashian divorce. Yeah. It was a Kardashian divorce. It How old really were your painful. children? They were eight and 10. Okay. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out, if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. 
Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. The service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. And they didn't know a thing, nothing yep. until then. They actually said, but mom, you never had any fights, nothing. Yep. We never fought, we never argued. I kept everything inside. Yeah. But I knew that I need to leave Etel's life. Yeah. I am tired of chasing. I'm tired of controlling. I'm tired of manipulating. I'm tired of trying to be the pretty girl, the smart girl, the sweet girl, the whatever girl, so I can get love. Because that's what addiction does. Addiction comes first. If you ask any addict what comes first, of course it's a substance. Yep. And has nothing to do with the person, but I try to be better so he can choose me. Oh, well, that's all good luck, right? <laughs> and I know that some listeners here feel the same way because many addicts choose a relationship with an addict yep. and they go to the same chasing cycle. Choose me, choose me, yep. choose me. Interesting. So what, what year was that when you um, finally decided to leave? 2000, uh, the end of 2012, this is okay. when I, the end of 2012, I said, that's, that's it. We're living in 2013. We got divorced. Okay. It was a year and a half of crazy family court here in LA, not recommended people. Um, it was hard. <laughs> yeah. It was really hard. And, um, did you end up with custody of the, of the kids? Yes, okay. I did. Yes. Okay. Yes. I did. We actually ended up having a mediation because we both figured out that the cycle in the family court wasn't an easy one. It was um, another hearing and another hearing and losing another room in our home and another room in our We sold our house uh, and we decided to go to mediation. And yes, our kids are amazing. I learned to stop micromanage. I cannot decide for anyone else how to micromanage and what to do with their kids. Right. This is really his decision and my decision. We have an agreement on things. We live not far from each other it's because it's not the kid's fault. And uh, we learn to respectfully live together. I yep. wouldn't say lovingly, but respectfully. Definitely. No, I, I get it. Is he still um, is he still using drugs? I love this question. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, everyone asks me this question and I say, I really don't know. OK, really, Johnny is none of my business. It's Understood. none of my business, you know, somebody says recovery. My business are my kids, not his recovery. Yeah. And, but, but, you know, for me to say that, that's a huge recovery. Understood. All I did all of my life was chasing to see if he's using or not. It's, you know, my business is me. Well, the, I think, and I think the only reason I ask is because like he, the kids will visit him, right? Yeah, they visit him all the time, yeah. Uh, and he must be, a, if he's still addicted, he must be somewhat of a functioning addict, I would think, or yes. uh -huh. they wouldn't be able to go see him. Okay, fair enough. Um, and I don't even know if he's, you know, sober or, or you know, using, and, and I want to tell, tell you, even when he was using, when we were together, he was functioning, he went to work, he made yeah. really good money, he was, but it's the inside, it's the inside that was rotten. It was me being, you know, I always tell my clients, you know, when we were in session, don't go to the gorilla. Don't go to the cage with a gorilla. Yeah. You know, because when the addict is using, the addiction wants to create arguments. Yeah. The addiction wants to fight with you. The addiction wants to control. So when that happens, just let it be. Yeah. Because what the addiction wants is to call you to the cage with a gorilla. And here you go. You have a fight. Yeah. I used to go there. Now I'm like, you know, not my monkey, not my business, right? I'm not going in. Yep. Tell that. me, tell me about your book. Unaddicted okay, to love. So, I like that. Yes. To you. Unaddicted to you. Unaddicted to Sounds you. Sounds like it should be a song. It is a song. It's like, you know, the song, I'm addicted, addicted to you. To, so it's like, or addicted, addicted to, to love. Addicted you to know love. I mean, I get oh, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're all addicted to love. Um, so before the, I'll tell you about my book, let me tell you what is addiction to love. You ready for the story? Sure. I love telling stories. Remember, I used to clean, you know, places and clean yeah, things yeah, yeah. and tell stories. So can you imagine, you know, you have a route that you're going every day, let's say from your, you know, car to your office or from your office to your car, from your home. It was like this certain one day on this, you know, walk, you see an old lady and you're like, hi, you know, she's like, hi. And she's looking at you and she's giving you a $50 bill. And you look at him like, oh, no, thank you. And she's like, no, this is for you. And you're like, no, 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 thank you. And she's giving you, she insisting that you'll take the $50 bill and you take it and you're like, okay, thank you. The next day, guess what? She's right there. She's sitting there with a $50 bill. 
And you're like, again, no, no, no. And she's insisting and all that. And you take the $50 bill. What happens on the third day? Before you even leave the house, you're like, hmm, I wonder if she's there or not, right? And all, you know, you think about it and you leave and oops, she's there. And then the fourth night and the fifth night and your psyche knows what's going to happen in the morning. The old lady is going to be there with what? With the $50, right? Yep. Seventh night, you're in bed and you're like, hmm, I wonder if she's going to be there. And you go and she's not there. And you just kind of like get really upset and not upset, but disappointed she's not there. All this day, you're thinking about this old lady. You're not even thinking about the $50. And you know, $50 is not a change. But you're thinking about the old lady. She's going to be there, but she's not going to be there. And that's what happens in the next few weeks. Sometimes she comes, sometimes she's not. And this is addiction. What we want to recreate, what the addiction want to create, is the first excitement of like, ooh, she's there. You know, and it's the chase of like, is it going to come? It's not going to come. Oh, she's there. Or she's not. It's almost like a mind game. The same thing with people who are addicted to people. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's going to love me. It's not going to love me. It's, you know, and when I speak with my clients, I always differentiate between the excitement of, ooh, you know what it is, or real love. Many people confuse it. Mm-hmm. And that's why many people after the few first dates are like, oh, but they don't love me. But there was no love in the beginning. There was excitement in the beginning. Right? Yep. Okay, so let's go back to the book. So actually, the book I wrote when we were in court, uh, we were in no front court, and I wrote everything that I felt in the book. I wrote it at two o'clock at night, three o'clock at night, I couldn't fall asleep, and I hid it in the door. I never wanted to touch it any time. That's it, the divorce were over. And two years later, when I started healing, because it took me a while, you know, one of the chapters in my book, I love this chapter. It's uh, put down the magnifying glass and pick up the mirror. And that's what I finally did. I put down the magnifying glass and I pick up the mirror. No more chasing after the other people. No more micro managing other people. Just looking at me. And I have a mirror with a heart, actually, that mm-hmm. shows that what's really important is me. I'm not talking about the vain, you know, selfies, putting in social media. No, I get it. It starts yeah. with you. Starts and we with and we you. say that even with drug addiction or alcohol addiction, like you have to start with, you know, you and wanting to make yourself better because nobody else can do it for you. Exactly. Exactly. And put down the magnifying glass, pick up the mirror. I start really getting better. And somebody told me, I already published two books um, and actually, um, First book is for parenting. The second book is a series of five children's book. I published one and then I thought it's a book about a little fish with mommy and daddy. And I thought, wait, 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 why only mommy and daddy? Mm-hmm. So I did the same book with mommy and daddy, mommy and mama, daddy and papa, single mom, single dad, different mm-hmm. illustrations. And somebody said, why don't you publish a book about your story? And the first thought was like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. A book about that. I can't tell the story of you know, my, the dad of my kids and my kids, but I spoke and people listened. Mm. So it's a 360 pages book. It's a, it's a Harry Potter book <laughs> that tells not my story, but a lot of gems and a lot of pearls to people who are in the same situation, in the same place. And this is what I love to give, you know, more of the tools and what to do and something like that happened rather than this is me, 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 my story. Right. Okay? Understood. So right. if, if you could give one piece of advice to the people who are listening, who are living with someone who's addicted or have their own addictions, what would that be? Ooh. I know that's heavy duty. One piece of advice, only one. One. No, I'm just okay. <laughs> one. Okay. Let me see. Um, one. Let's doesn't see. have to be. So one, one that I love. I know one is, I mean, I'll give two. Okay. okay, I'll give you know. so when my clients come to me and I hear it in you know seminars and workshops and they start, he 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 did. I was there, he did and he did this and did. my mom was there still sometimes. He 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 I call it the monkey talk. It's like he 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 by the way in Hebrew he is she, so it's like the same conversation. Oh, yeah, he 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 it's like okay, let's stop the monkey conversation. Let's talk in I. You know, even when you want to talk to someone, this is the base of relationship. I, not he, 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 you know, and that drops you from the victim mode 
into the active. Now we're taking an action instead of being in the victim mode. It's very easy for all of us to be in the victim mode. Mercy on me, mercy on me, my life is miserable. I'm like, you know, this is where my Israeli commander, you know, comes into play. I'm like, okay, you pay me by the hour. Are we going to do the hee hee? Are we going to monitor you? You can do the hee hee, but I don't think you pay me for that. So this is the first, you know, tool that I always, because you can hear yourself. You know, even sometimes you record yourself. It's the hee hee hee, okay? Second thing is people pleasing. Yeah, you wanted to say something. No, right? No, oh, yeah. I, I just so, think it's a great it's a great piece of advice. And I think, again, you know, even a lot of addicts, you know, they say, well, you know, I'm I'm still an addict because my mother this or my mother that or my father this or my father that. And I think, you know, they have to get to the point of like, you know, you made some decisions and you made some choices. And, you know, let's start with you. Let's start with me. And I'm not saying that, you know, yes, we all have a story, but this mm-hmm. is our glory. We all have something that brought, I mean, I am so grateful for my dad and my mom. I'm beyond grateful for my ex-husband. I wouldn't be sitting here with you. I wouldn't have this book and I wouldn't have this amazing, amazing clientele and Instagram and everything that I do without this story. But I chose to take it this route instead of sitting in my victimhood, which I did for a long time. And that didn't work. That didn't work. So when you're, you have a story about your parents and guess what? Your parents yourselves didn't know about it. So it's time to break the chain of generations. You know, nobody had the tools. I mean, it's incredible what we have these days. Everything is like, in a, you know, like boom, right? Um, so use these tools. I'm not saying it's easy. You know, people look at me today and like, are you so happy? Well, mm-hmm. I work hard on this happy. I really, really do. It's an inside job and it's an outside job, but I'm happy today, Johnny. This is my life today. I so let's it. go back to the next tool, to the second tool. So the second tool was people pleasing, right? right? We right. all people pleaser, okay? From different manipulative reasons. Oh, I'm going to do this and then the person is going to do that. Or this actually is really intense with people who live or are in contact with an addict. The people pleasing is getting so embedded because the need to be approved is deep, deep, deep. And as you said, it, it is come from childhood. Because what happens when I'm choosing someone that I need to fix and I need to change psychologically, and again, I'm, this is my you know psychology um, background, I will fix my parents and then I will be good. Because no, nobody taught me to self-soothe myself. No one. I don't know how to do it, so I'm going to fix somebody else, and that's going to soothe me. I'm going to change someone else, and then I'm going to be better. Because, what, am I going to fix myself? (laughs) That's too hard. I'm going to fix someone because I can do it. So people get to be people-pleasing. So are you ready for the next tool? Yes. Write it down, people. Oh, (laughs) people-pleasing. Oh, I'm, yeah. (laughs) People-pleasing equals lying. People pleasing equals lying. You lying not only to the other people, but you are lying to yourself. Mm. And when you lie to yourself, how can you love yourself? So quit this people pleasing. Quit lying to yourself. You're not a pizza and you're not ice cream. Not everybody's going to like you. And that's what I have this big smile. I tell people, I'm sorry, I'm not pizza. I'm not ice cream. You know, not everybody likes me, but I love me. Yeah. I don't have to do it anymore. Yep. Here we go. That's huge. So where yes. can people get your book? So oof, my book is, of course, on Amazon. All of yep. my books are on Amazon, but also on Bars and Nobles, uh, Target. I mean, I, everywhere, almost every bookstore. It's also in, uh, internationally. So all over Europe, um, people want to And you have your to... own website, right? And it's your yes. name. Etalight.com. Yes. So Etalight.com. Also, signshine.com and my work, I work with individuals, but I also work with families. I help families because I believe that the work should be not only as adults, but as babies. So I do a lot of work with babies and families to create this communication when, from from babyhood, because babies are born without words. So if we create this, how many families are going to be healthier? And my Instagram, I love connecting on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You get lots of tools and Guess what? I started this little funny reels too. So if you want to see me doing reels with sound, so my IG, my Instagram is etelite. And that's E-T-E-L-L-E-I-T. 
Mm-hmm. So there yes. you go. Dot com or Instagram. Etel, thank you so much for being willing to talk to us today and tell us your story and give us just some real diamond gems worth of wisdom and experience that I think a lot of our people are going to be able to use. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having uh, my, um, having, sorry, me on your podcast. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, and I look forward, you know what I love the most is connecting with the listeners through DMs. This is what really touches my heart. I get DMs of people who tell me, I tell this is my story. You know, don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed. I was embarrassed until I had my mentor. So DM me. It starts with this little note to someone and then you never know where it's going to go. So I'm inviting the listeners to really connect with me. It's not only about the story. It's really about healing. Thank you. I I love it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the interview today. Um, My mistake, I thought that Itel had her own addiction to drugs. Um, When I read in her bio about being found almost dead on the floor, but as you heard, it had more to do with the stress of her relationship um, to her addicted husband. So just to clarify that point. And also uh, she she touched on it, but she um, teaches signing for babies. Um, You know, when when babies are very little, they are not able to communicate with words and she teaches signs, babies signing. I know that my, some of my grandchildren knew that. So that's another aspect. She's got um, a couple different books on Amazon. I'll put up a picture of their cover here on the video. And um, her name once again is Etel, E-T, E-L, and her last name is L-E-I-T, and it's hername.com is her website and her name on Instagram, and as she said, she would love for you to direct message her. So have a great week. If you think that Etel can help you, be sure and reach out, and if she's not the right person for you, at least reach out to someone and get some help. You can always reach out to us if you'd like. We would love to help you if we possibly can. Have a good week. We'll be back again with another interview. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.